Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Tinka. I'm a grad student here at UC Berkeley. Um, before we get started, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Citrus Research Exchange, as well as a welcome to our viewers at UC Davis, UC Merced, and UC Santa Cruz. Uh, before we begin, there's a couple of announcements. Tomorrow, Thursday, from 1 o'clock to 3 p.m., there's a big ideas poster session and final judging of students' presentations here in the atrium of the third floor of the Citrus Building. Uh, secondly, on Friday, there will be an I4 Energy talk this week uh, in the auditorium at noon on optimal de demand response and power flow. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. James G. Bellingham is the chief technologist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. His personal research activity revolves around the development and use of autonomous underwater vehicles. In the process of developing these vehicles, he spent considerable time at sea, leading over 20 AUV ex expeditions. Dr. Bellingham leads the Autonomous Under Ocean Sampling Network program at Embari, which uses fleets of autonomous vehicles to adapt to and observe rapidly changing oceanographic processes. Uh, let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I've done is I've, uh, I've mixed a little bit of technology and a little bit of the application space together in this, uh, in this talk, which is pretty much how I approach technology, being, being a technologist. Uh, 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 my particular slant is, uh, is to work very close to the application uh, domain. And of course, that, that being in an oceanographic institution, I, I, I focus on ocean science problems. Uh, I think that uh, you know, some of the exemplar problems really of the day in, in the ocean sciences revolve around how marine organisms respond to changes in their physical uh, and, and chemical environment. Uh, the ocean's an unbelievably dynamic place. Uh, the chemistry in the ocean is largely determined by the microbes. Uh, the ocean, to some degree, are kind of the lungs of the planet. They determine to a large degree the, the chemistry of the atmosphere. And yet we really don't understand these organisms. We, don't, we, we barely know who's there, and we, we certainly don't know what they're doing. And we, do, we really don't understand how they organize themselves. Uh, uh, the microbial world in the ocean environment is, is dynamic. Uh, we don't understand how these organisms uh, 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 enhance their chances of survival. Uh, we don't understand why sometimes... Well, we do have some inkling, uh, but, but we can't really predict with certainty why they suddenly explode in, in uh, numbers in certain times of the year uh, and why they suddenly crash, uh, perhaps in days, uh, uh, sometime later. A number of different reasons why that, why that could be the case. And as a consequence, we have a very difficult time uh, understanding how these organisms are, gonna, are going to uh, respond to cha changing climate conditions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to give you a bit of a feeling about the robotics because uh, my particular piece of my particular uh, piece of this is applying robotic systems to understanding these uh, marine organisms. I really come from a physical oceanographic background. I, I was trained as a physicist, so the biology is new to me. Uh, I'm on the bottom of a steep, steep learning curve. I've, I've been saying that for five years. And uh, you know, every time I think I'm reaching sort of uh, closer to the summit, I realize that no, in fact, <laughs> I'm still at the bottom of the hill. But that kind of makes it interesting. Uh, uh, now, fortunately, we're at a point where AUVs are quite immature. They're changing a lot. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are changing uh, how we build them in order to adapt to the problems. And particular focus are these biological process experiments. And I'll talk a bit about those. And then finally, some, some uh, discussion of next generation ocean observing systems. So first, a, a primer on, on AUVs. In the ocean environment, uh, for, for uh, actually most of ocean sciences, uh, we have observed the sea from ships. Uh, and ships, uh, so a scientist will, will compete for ship time, will go to sea, and will conduct their science from the deck of a ship, uh, lowering instruments into the ocean or perhaps going into the ocean in a human-occupied vehicle. In the, in, in the last couple of decades, the big change has been the introduction of robotic systems. And robotic systems show up in a lot of different ways. So for those of you who watched uh, the 
any of that footage from the Gulf of Mexico, you saw numerous remotely operated vehicles. Those are tele-operated systems. They're tethered to ships, and they're operated by human operators. Uh, they're uh, tremendously powerful platforms. <clears throat> Anand and Barr, we, we work on them. But another class of platform really revolves around severing that tether and allowing the vehicle to operate free of the ship. And you get a lot of benefits uh, by doing that. That tether is an enormous constraint, uh, both on the ship and, and on the vehicle. And so this, is, this kind of shows you what uh, one of our more standard vehicle systems looks like. Uh, we call these Dorado vehicles. Diameter of this system here is about uh, 21 inches in diameter. Uh, for those of you who know about such things, uh, that happens to match uh, a common uh, submarine launch torpedo. Uh, early days of AUVs, a lot of these systems were actually uh, dis uh, funded by Office of Naval Research. Office of Naval Research had uh, a clear sense that the logistics of certain platforms were well taken care of. Uh, never any intent of launching this from a submarine tube, but everyone understood how to move around 21-inch diameter systems. It does look like a torpedo, but it's quite different. Uh, for one thing, it goes a lot slower. Uh, this thing only goes about three knots. Uh, for another thing, it's much deeper rated. So this system here you're looking at is a 6,000 meter rated system. Most of it is flooded with seawater. Uh, there's a pressure vessel there. There's a pressure vessel there. There's a pressure vessel there. The rest of this is exposed to ambient pressure, which at, uh, at 6,000 meters is about 9,000 pounds per square inch. And so that, that, that uh, creates a lot of design, a lot of design issues. Uh, these vehicles are small compared to what people thought, you know, systems uh, ought to be like, uh, at least in the middle 90s. And that allowed you to use a lot of uh, design techniques, like these things are mostly plastic and syntactic foam. Uh, there's really not that much metal in it. Uh, they last not that long. Uh, this vehicle here runs for about... Uh, 24 hours. Uh, it carries quite a sophisticated payload. It uh, makes maps of the bottom of the ocean, uh, probably the highest resolution maps uh, of any vehicle. It also can uh, do things like look for shipwrecks, has side scan, and it has a sub-bottom profiler to look into the seafloor. And this is kind of the preferred platform uh, by this day for, for, making, uh, for doing certain classes of ocean observing. Uh, but, you know, at a 24-hour endurance, you're still pretty much tied to a ship. What, what drives that endurance? Well, one way to think about vehicle design is to think about it in terms of energy. Energy really is our fundamental constraint in designing underwater systems. Uh, and you can really sort of divide that energy use into two general categories. One has a velocity-dependent term. Of course, that's the propulsion. The other is just everything else. Uh, it's the hotel load, and you generally treat that as a constant. Hotel load, by the way, is a term which comes uh, from naval architecture. Uh, of course, on a ship, you know, you, you think of it supporting humans, thus the, t thus the, thus the uh, word hotel. But this is an, an, an autonomous vehicle. It's your computer, your navigation systems, your location devices, your sensors, all of that sort of thing. And the total energy you use is going to be a function of the propulsion power, the hotel load, and, of course, the time you run your survey. And that propulsion power is a velocity cubed. Uh, dependence. And so what happens is when you look at this as a function of the speed of your vehicle and as a function of your hotel load, you find this enormous dependence on hotel load. And uh, that hotel load in turn drives speed. So here you can see if I can keep my hotel load to one watt, the optimum speed for this particular system is actually under a half a meter a second. That's about one knot if you think of it, uh, it, it, depending on what units you're comfortable with. Whereas, you know, once you're up to 100 watts or more, you know, now this vehicle wants to run at about three knots. Uh, and, of course, its, its range is much reduced. And that's really kind of what shapes uh, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles today. You have a lot of vehicles that are designed around sort of this extreme here, very low power sensors, very long endurance, uh, comparatively low speeds, and then you have a set of vehicles which are optimized up here, sort of much higher power sensor systems, uh, uh, fairly short endurance, like I say, a day, you know, of order a day, and significantly higher speeds. And here's a picture of a vehicle which is one of these very long endurance systems. This is actually uh, designed at Scripps. Uh, this vehicle doesn't have a propeller on it. It actually propels itself through the ocean by changing its buoyancy. And as it changes its buoyancy, it either drifts up or sinks. And uh, these wings on it actually take that, uh, vertical, that vertical motion and translate that into forward motion. 
And these things will go on the order of maybe 25 centimeters a second through the ocean, but they'll do that for many, many months, profiling back and forth between the surface and a depth of 600 meters, 1,000 meters, something, something like that. So this is one class of systems. It doesn't, of course, carry a lot in the way of payload. Uh, that's, uh, that's intentional. That's done to keep that hotel load down. Now, how do you actually survey ocean processes? I told you at the beginning, ocean processes are incredibly dynamic. They change quickly. So if I were to take a picture of this room with a one hour exposure setting, you would all be blurs and we would see blurs going in and out. It would be very hard to count, for example, the number of people in the room. Uh, you need to be able to make your observations on a time scale which is shorter than the time scale of the process that you're measuring. How do you do that with lots of platforms? Well, this is, this is some calculations we did sort of early on when we were thinking about how to actually do practical observations in the ocean. And what we realized was there's a very interesting scaling law as you went to multiple platforms. So here's again that same equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I'm, I'm propulsion limited. So I'm putting most of my power into propulsion. Uh, that lets me set the hotel load to zero. Uh, being a physicist, that makes me happy. I like setting things to zero or getting it within a factor of two anyway. Uh, and here, here is then what your total energy consumption is going to look like. You have that velocity cube term and you have tau. Now let's say I do that same survey and I do it with two vehicles. What happens then? Well, what happens then is the path length that each vehicle goes drops by a factor of two. The time stays the same, so my speed drops by a factor of two. So each vehicle consumes one-eighth the power. I have two vehicles. My total, the total energy consumed by my observation system is now a factor of four lower. So this was, kind of a pre this was actually a pretty powerful realization that, in fact, in an energy-limited environment, when you're kind of in an energy economy, if you will, for your robotic systems, in the ocean environment, actually, you get driven towards multi-platform systems very quickly, especially if you can make your sensors very, uh, very efficient. And in fact, uh, this, is, uh, this is the first time, you know, I, I said we kind of realized this in the mid-90s. It, it, it took us 10 years to actually get all of the pieces together and get it working. And this is the tracks of platforms in a field program, which is uh, 2003, actually, so a while ago now. But this is when everything first finally works. So each of these colors uh, represents sort of a different class of robot. This is a month-long field program. It has an average of about 11 vehicles in the ocean at any given time. Uh, and they're all, in effect, tuned to particular observations. These here are doing deep uh, observations looking at the California current and undercurrent system in Monterey Bay. And here are some systems looking at the upwelling plume. So this color is sea surface temperature, and here's upwelling near the shore. And then these straight lines are the shorter range propeller-driven vehicles, which are only out for a day or so, but which carry a much more comprehensive sensor suite. And uh, you know, the idea here is that they're going to capture that evolving biology uh, in, that, in that upwelling plume. So pretty cool. We were incredibly excited when this worked. And by the way, this was a large team, many institutions involved in, in this particular program. In effect, sort of each class of platforms had kind of an institution with it, plus modelers. So, uh, so a, lot of, a lot of people contributed to the success of this of this general idea, but nonetheless, this is not that large an area. You're only really looking at a 100 by 100 kilometer area here, which is a pretty small patch of, patch of ocean. And what happened is, is as this stuff started working and we started talking with uh, uh, our, our colleagues about where we go from here, one of the things we realized was, well, this was, this was a very small patch and it wasn't really giving us sort of a full picture of what was going on offshore California here. So here's a picture, if you sort of expand out, where you realize that, in fact, you know, in this nearshore environment, which is dominated by upwelling, so it's that cold, deeper water coming to the surface, bringing nutrients. Uh, and then offshore, you have this warmer oligotrophic ocean. You know, this is, this is water which doesn't have so much nutrients. These are two very different regimes. And in effect, if you really want to understand the ecosystem off of the coast of California, you need observational capability, which gets you out here. So there's a 500 kilometer line. The vehicle would have to be able to run 1,000 kilometers out and back 
you can already do that with a glider, but there was a lot of interest in doing that with sensors, which would be uh, chemical and biological sensors. So in effect, creating a vehicle with a greater payload capacity. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a lot of interest in, you know, well, why stop there? Uh, there's Hawaii uh, down there in the corner there. If you can go sort of 4,000 kilometers or so, you can begin to reach uh, from the west coast to Hawaii. And that's kind of one of the longest ocean crossings. Once you can go there, you can island hop, you know, kind of across the Pacific. A lot of volunteers to go and, and, and you know, stay in Hawaii on the receiving end for the vehicle, as, as, you, can, as you can imagine. So that led us to the idea that, that, that after, after about 15 years of experimenting with AUVs, uh, getting them to work in some field programs, we really needed to take another run at this because we were beginning to get a very different picture of what we needed from the platforms. And in particular, what folks were interested in was being able to cover large areas and be able to persist for long amounts of time. And this is to give you a feeling, again, coming back at that design space and a little bit more granularity to understand what is actually contributing to that range and endurance. So up here, as you actually run through the design cycle of the vehicle, uh, you spend a lot of effort sort of minimizing the drag of the uh, platform. Now, I can tell you when I started designing AUVs, the way I did it is I went to a bunch of tests which had been done at DTRC uh, for standard, uh, standard submarine shapes, and I used those for designing the vehicle. Uh, next, this time around, what we did was we went to CFD. Uh, and we went to uh, a set of analytical calculations, basically, for optimizing our design. And what we found was we could get a, a better drag from, from a vehicle which actually was much more useful in the sense that it was adaptable. So one of the problems with a lot of the submarine designs we had been working with was they didn't have a parallel mid-body. When you wanted to add something that expanded beyond the original envelope of the vehicle, you couldn't do it without making an entire new vehicle. Whereas a vehicle with a par parallel mid-body, you can extend it in length, and you haven't changed really the fundamental fore or aft portion of the vehicle. So the question was, was could you define sort of the nose and the tail of the vehicle in such a way that you would have some flexibility in the length and still have, and still have uh, uh, excellent performance? And the answer, surprisingly, was yes. Uh, and then uh, once you have all of this, you begin to really optimize your propulsion system. So you can kind of see down here, you've got your propeller design. Propeller design is very, uh, uh, the uh, design of your propeller is very intimately connected to the wake of the platform. You can kind of think of it as your propeller ideally cancels out the wake <laughs> of, the, of the vehicle. And once you have that, you can optimize your motor selection and gearbox if you're going to have a gearbox. There's a whole set of things. How many things are sticking out from the vehicle? I've already talked about hotel load, battery performance. Big improvements in that, driven by industry, uh, and they continue to approve. Uh, it's not a, it's nothing like Moore's law, but you know every 10% improvement in performance uh, uh, makes an enormous difference for us. And of course, size. So these things all for us, so when you ran through them, we realized that we could actually make a vehicle which had much better performance than our prior ones. Instead of a vehicle with a 100 kilometer range, uh, we realized 1,000 kilometers was a reasonable target. And so that's what we set ourselves, a goal. 1,000 kilometers, an 8-watt payload, uh, you know, a meter at a meter per second. And then, by the way, you shut all of those sensors off, and this vehicle should be able to go 4,000 kilometers. And that gets you to Hawaii. Of course, you do that at a lower speed. And then what's more, we want to be able to sort of hang out on the water column and observe things for longer periods of time. So it needs to be able to trim itself to neutral buoyancy and just drift. And of course, we want it to be low enough cost to be operated in significant numbers. So we went ahead and built this vehicle. Uh, and uh, and uh, our performance actually, so this is, uh, this is last fall, a field program. And what I'm going to show you are measurements made by the vehicle and what you'll see is up here in this corner, you'll see the track of the vehicle out away from Monterey Bay out on something called Line 67. Up here, you will see a temperature. Down here, you'll see salinity. And then here, you'll see chlorophyll. And over in these two boxes, you'll see a set of optical properties which correspond to, uh, uh, in effect, the vehicle flight path in those two boxes. So, so here we go. Uh, there the vehicle sets off. Uh, you can see sort of the uh, uh, you know, warm, uh, war comparatively warm surface water as you get further offshore. 
Uh, you get into uh, you get into some regions where there you go pass through a pretty significant front. You can see here you've got a phyto you've got a phytoplankton layer which is hanging out at somewhere between uh, uh, 20 and 40 meters. Uh, down here this is day and night cycle, so you can see that there's some diurnal uh, migration beginning to show up. And now the vehicle is back onshore and running uh, back and forth. In fact, uh, although we had a 1,000 kilometer range goal in this mission, the vehicle ran 1,800 kilometers at full speed. So we significantly exceeded it. Uh, so these things are really, uh, for us, uh, opening entire new vistas. As a matter of fact, in this field program, we, it's actually what you saw was almost three field programs. The vehicle did an offshore section. It actually rendezvoused with the ship in the middle of that did a set of observations around the ship, and then this nearshore uh, por portion was actually a benthic exchange experiment with, uh, with a, a different group of PIs. So, uh, so now the thing is, is once you have a platform like that, what, can, what other things do you want to do with it? Well, the beauty is, is that, uh, if you ha is, is that uh, there is a whole uh, group of very smart people working on advanced instrumentation for the biological ocean. Uh, here's an example of that instrumentation. Uh, Chris Sholin, uh, who actually happens to be my boss, our, our president at Ambari, uh, is developed, has been spending quite a bit of time developing something called the ESP. It's Environmental Sample Processor. It's basically a laboratory in the can. It can do DNA identification of organisms. So it sucks the organisms in, it breaks them down, it extracts their DNA. It has a set of... Uh, of uh, 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 probe arrays, uh, and you do sandwich hybridization in the existing version, uh, and then it has a microscope, and it can observe those. And normally now, the system here, the existing system, actually stands about this high. It's attached to a mooring, and it sends that data back to shore. But that group is now actively making a payload system for this long-range long AUV. And so our hope is that what we'll be able to do is begin to run, in effect, these, uh, these types of experiments, which currently you can really only do with the ship, uh, be able to do it with a comparatively small AUV offshore. So what are the other, what are the other technologies that contribute to that? Well, autonomy, uh, supervision, those are all very big factors, of course, in the performance of these systems. Now, in fact, uh, you know, if there were more time, I would actually show you what the portal to this vehicle looks like. But these vehicles are profiling between a depth, say, 100 meters, 300 meters, and the surface. And since you're coming up to the surface, it's not that big a deal to actually go to the surface, get a GPS update, and telemeter some of the data home. So, in fact, uh, what I found is, although we work hard to make these vehicles autonomous, uh, this, my, my science colleagues uh, 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 tend to be much more hands-on with the vehicles. They want to see the data in real time, and they want to be able to command the vehicles, you know, say, on a daily basis. And so what you find is you find that you have uh, uh, this interesting sort of trade space for where it really makes sense to be autonomous and where it makes sense to really think of it as more a supervised system. So, and it really has to do with the rate of change uh, of the environment that the system has to react to and the frequency with which you have communications. And so for our vehicle, if it comes up to the surface every hour, that's actually fairly frequent. Uh, and so it really only has to be autonomous on the time frame of an hour. If, on the other hand, you're running 24 hours or multiple days, uh, now you really have, uh, have to be uh, autonomous much longer. And what would cause you to do that? Well, a couple of things. One, for sure, is running under ice. Then you just don't have any communications. But another is when the process you're observing is so dynamic uh, that you actually have to go back, you actually have to stick with it. You can't take the time to come to the surf surface and communicate back. And that turns out to be the case for a lot of biological processes. So here are, uh, I tend to think of autonomy as almost sort of an emergent property of a, of a system, which is a function of a variety of technologies rather than one technology. I mean, certainly decision making is a central technology, but it's not the only one. Uh, for example, most vehicles problems at sea occur because of mis uh, mission configuration problems. So the human operator always knows more than the vehicle. You're at sea, you're bobbing around, uh, maybe you're in, up in the middle of the night, you're a bit tired. Uh, this is a very easy place to make mistakes. And you know, the, the tendency then is to only have the vehicle do simple things. But of course, that's not what you want. You want the vehicle to do complex things. So this mission configuration is a real limitation in the capability of, of the system. 
onboard decision making and control, uh, of course, you know, how, do, how does the vehicle take in information from its various sensors, perhaps from, uh, from shore, uh, uh, contextual information, and how does it then use that information to accomplish uh, your desired mission? And then perception over here, which I put separately from onboard decision making, and this really has to do with how you abstract that information that the vehicle is sensing. And, and this is actually, in the underwater environment, quite, quite a tough problem. Uh, most of our sensors are not that good. Uh, they're noisy, they have uh, outliers, they, you can't treat them as Gaussian, for example, particularly uh, in, the, in the navigation space. Uh, and so I always say that if I have a really good sensor that tells me there's a cylindrical object sitting over there, and here's the XYZ coordinates relative to the robot, it's very easy to go, you know, write some software to go pick it up. If all I have are a bunch of pixels which show me, in effect, what the light field is over there, it's a tougher problem. And so to the degree that you have better sensors that provide you more abstract information, this is simpler, and this is simpler, because the most complicated part of mission configuration actually has to do with dealing with contingencies for, for failure. So, uh, so what are some examples of sort of tasks that you might do which you know, use some level of autonomy? Well, you know, here is running through a, here's a vehicle moving up and down in the water column. There's that one of these phytoplankton layers, and what you want to do is you want to file a sampler right in the middle of that and capture it right at the peak. Now, to the vehicle, what this looks like is it looks like a time series, right? And so it's kind of like this is the stock market, and what you want to do is you want to grab it right at the peak in this particular case. But, of course, you don't really know the peak. It's the peak until after it's passed. You can try a derivative form, you know, as soon as the slope changes, but it turns out this is a very noisy signature, so that derivative <laughs> The time constant on the derivative there is quite long, and you'll be well past it. So what we do is we actually use the fact that these structures actually have some horizontal spatial extent, and we recognize we're entering a phytoplankton layer here, and there's a pre-trigger process which tells us what depth and sort of what intensity is, and when you come down on the other, other side, you then trigger your sample when you're preaching the right depth. And here you can see uh, the uh, pre-triggers and the, and the trigger peaks, and it's doing an excellent job. It does an excellent job. So this actually uh, was, it sounds very simple, and it actually, it, it's not that simple, but it's not that complicated either. This is work by Yan Wu Zhang, uh, one of my, my teammates. But this is actually really, uh, it's just simple things that kind of turn the corner. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, most of my colleagues were saying, don't have the vehicle do anything smart, only I know where to sample. There's no way the vehicle can know where to sample. Now they're saying, this is the way to do it. There's no way I could tell you where this thin layer is, but the vehicle can sample very accurately. I can tell the vehicle to sample just above it, just in it, and just below it. And I can do that with certainty in a way that I couldn't if I tried to do it pre-programmed. And so now you begin to have people insisting on having autonomy in platforms is uh, quite a change. Now, I mentioned that, that another, uh, another one of our problems revolves around uh, uh, things changing so quickly. Uh, this is actually a script, uh, so these uh, plankton patches have a horizontal extent, and of course they're moving through space at the same time, and so here is a vehicle which is moving through a phytoplankton patch and it's attempting to map it, and this is an autonomous, an autonomous vehicle. We're intentionally looking at it here in uh, the Earth frame of reference. And what you can see is the vehicle goes through here, it says, ah, I've gone through a patch, now I'm gonna go off to the side, I'm gonna try to run through it perpendicularly and get the cross, uh, uh, the cross section of it in the, in the opposite axis. Oh, it's moved over here, I'm gonna go and try again. Oh, it's drifted way down here. So you can see that the vehicle here is actually, in this case, kind of struggling to follow this patch. And in fact, the currents are going this way, we know that know that from HF radar. But this is an example of the kind of autonomy now that you really need to put on the vehicle, and I'll get into exactly what the motivations are in this next section in the biological process experiments. So I've already kind of walked through sort of these exemplar problems. You know, what are the reasons uh, why, we, why we are interested in studying these biological systems? All, uh, I, I think one of the key things uh, really revolves around the fact, if I can take a step back and just sort of you know, reflect on the fact that when you do, uh, when you observe the physical ocean, in the physical ocean, you have a great equation, right? You have uh, Navier-Stokes, which we believe it's well tested. Uh, there's certainly problems using it computationally in the ocean, but you have an equation for it. 
for biology, you're really in a very different, uh, when you're attempting to study these marine ecosystems, you're in a very different situation. The fundamental relationships and equations are not known. In fact, those are what you're trying to really infer. And so you need to be able to actually conduct quantitative experiments in the ocean. And one really interesting thing to be able to do is to resolve rates. So here's just the total derivative, which is a function of the intrinsic rate of change and then an advective term. And if you just sort of stick characteristic numbers in here, uh, an aggressive doubling time, a current, which is 20 centimeters a second, that's actually low for Monterey Bay, patch scale of one kilometer, what you find is you find that that advective term is a factor of 10 bigger than the intrinsic rate of change. So if you go out there in space and you stick a mooring out there and observe a biological population and generate a time series, in fact, what you're really observing is you're observing spatial change drifting by your mooring, and only 10% of that signal, roughly, is actually uh, variability in the population. And this really motivates our, uh, our, our outstanding interest in designing observation systems that move with the organisms. So the strategy uh, is uh, to use mobile systems that can find aggregations of organisms. Once you find them, you want to be able to follow them. Uh, and, uh, and this is a sort of very much a work in progress. Uh, we want to be able to characterize the ecosystem structure and change. That's really a function of sensors. Again, very much a work in progress. And we want endurances to be comparable to the lifetime of a bloom. So that means somewhere in the order of weeks uh, to maybe, maybe months. And so here's kind of our picture. So it's, again, it's sort of a multi-platform picture. Uh, we have a ship, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, there are always going to be capabilities which uh, you have in a laboratory environment or on a ship, which you're not going to have on your AUV. Uh, but in the water, you might have a range of smaller vehicles mapping out this environment. If you're near the shore, you have HF radar, which is telling you what the current is. You may have a larger vehicle, which is making water samples. And uh, you might have a drifter in here, which is in effect providing a Lagrangian reference frame or something close to a Lagrangian reference frame. And this, uh, you know, comparatively simple breakdown, but using a reasonably large number of robots, uh, is increasingly how, how we're working. And so here again is kind of this picture, right, of, of how you actually prosecute a field program. First, you have to go out and find where those blooms are. Once you've found a bloom, you need to pick a particular patch you want to work on. Now you need to track that patch, a number of different ways of doing it. And once you're tracking the patch, you now want to send your other bigger vehicle out, collect samples, and then, of course, you have a whole, a whole analysis phase. And so now I'm going to show you a picture of one of these experiments uh, which, we, which we conducted. Uh, and uh, what you're going to see is you're actually going to see three platforms here. So these little dots here are the color of those dots reflects sort of the maximum chlorophyll signal uh, in uh, that the, this long-range vehicle is seeing. Once in a little bit, what you'll see is a little green triangle come in. That's a Lagrangian drifter. It's going to provide a reference frame. And now the whole uh, reference frame is going to translate with that. So these background uh, bathymetry lines will begin to move. And then you'll see this fast-moving vehicle come in, and you'll see stars where, where it takes water samples. And this whole thing runs, uh, runs for a couple of days. Uh, this, by the way, was the experiment that convinced us that we couldn't really control things from shore. Uh, this vehicle's actually coming up at the various corners here, sending the data back and then going back down. Uh, and what became very clear to us was by the time we had the data back, we had looked at it, we had decided what to do, uh, and sent the vehicle back down, uh, everything had changed. Uh, and so we, knew, we decided at that point we really needed the on, onboard autonomy for the, uh, uh, for, the, uh, 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 for the patch tracking. So there you go, a bunch of samples from this faster moving vehicle chooses a variety of strategies. Kana Rajan in our lab uh, runs an autonomy, or in a, uh, at Ambari runs a autonomy research group. Uh, and so they do a lot of work on, on those types of things as well. Uh, there goes the big vehicle on the back of the boat, uh, zips off home, and now our little vehicle has come home and uh, the experiment is over. And this actually shows for that field program the path of all of the different assets that are in the water. And so I, I think you know, it's kind of a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a potluck, you know, an oceanographic potluck. You, know, you say you're going to have a party, you call up your friends, 
and they all bring their instruments and you start coordinating and then you call up a modeling friend and say hey could you run your model and uh, it's kind of the way the kind of the way these things coalesce and eventually you end up uh, with uh, more more robots than you you can uh, than you can count so so what are how is this evolving uh, you know where are we going to go in the future well what I, what I I, I want to return to this whole theme of energy uh, energy in the environment, uh, there's a lot of energy available in the environment out there, so it's kind of silly. We're in this very rich energy environment, and we're, we're carrying, every, you know, carrying around these very expensive batteries from shore. And this is just a snapshot from January of, uh, actually this is a climatology for January, of sort of the average solar uh, power, and you can see in this case it's mostly in the southern hemisphere, peaking out sort of 300 watts per square meter. Uh, we move across here to wind and you get higher uh, energy, uh, energy availability. So now you're up to kilowatts per meter, but of course that's sideways. Winds are roughly twice as high over the ocean as they are over land. Uh, and then down here you have wave energy. Now, now yet a different uh, thing, of course. Uh, you know, basically wave energy is sort of, you can kind of think of it as, well, not kind of, uh, uh, you know, the sun uh, generates the wind, uh, generates the waves. Right? So you'd kind of expect energy density would go down each time that you moved here. But in fact, there's kind of an accumulation th uh, thing that goes on. So in effect, what's happening here in particular is when you look at wave energy, you're looking at all of that dissipated wind energy all concentrated at the air-sea interface uh, and then integrated over long distance. And so what you get is you get tens and hundreds of kilowatts per linear meter of energy in the upper ocean. Now, most methods of... of uh, Transforming that into useful electrical energy are not that efficient, but frankly, there's so much there, you don't have to be that efficient to be a lot better than, than these, these other methods. And so, in fact, there's a, it was a DARPA program some years ago where they worked on a variety of different approaches. They actually tested in Monterey Bay. Uh, the outcome of that actually was uh, we built, ended up, they ended up uh, funding us to build a wave energy system, uh, which actually was structured like this. It uses a reaction plate. Which, uh, uh, which is in deeper, stiller water, which reacts against the surface float, which bobs up and down in the waves. And in between, you have this hydraulic system, which, which in effect absorbs that energy and turns it into electrical power. And uh, it's actually now been built. It generates on the order of hundreds of watts from the same size platform, which for wind and solar, we average about 50 watts. And now we're working on a docking system which will allow the AUVs to dock to this. And so this is kind of our picture. We would really like to be able to populate the ocean with our robots. And we'd like to be able to leave them out for long times. And our principal problem is power. And if we can solve that power problem, and we think this is one good way to solve that power problem, we can recharge our platforms. Our platforms, in turn, can recharge other things, like instrumentation on the seafloor. And when you have power, you also solve a lot of the communication problem, because you can use a high bandwidth uh, satellite comm system, and your cost per bit and energy per bit actually drops down. So you win, you win all the way around. Uh, this is just a little movie of a uh, docking system here, uh, an early docking system. So here's that 21-inch vehicle uh, being deployed from a ship, uh, diving. Uh, as it dives, uh, it uh, is acoustically ranging on the dock. Here's the dock. Uh, which is actually in shallow water, so you can see it's got some biofouling. Vehicle homes on the dock, uh, comes in the docking cone. It actually engages a RF link, which is very short range, but once it's in the dock and this dock is connected to shore by a cable, you're, and we're actually watching this on shore, uh, uh, watching this video on shore. Uh, this vehicle is now, uh, now being commanded to go back out again. You can dump the data, you can put it to sleep, you can reprogram it. Out it goes to start a new mission and off again. So uh, uh, there you are on shore, sipping your cappuccino and, and controlling your robot. It's a, it's a pretty cool way to do oceanography. So, so, uh, uh, so you know, once you do this, it really begins uh, to have all kinds of sort of knock-on effects that you didn't really anticipate. Uh, one of the really big ones revolves around uh, uh, distance collaboration. Uh, so we we realized in our 2003 experiment that if we could make a really good data system, a data portal, that all of those people who had to come to Monterey to collaborate in the experiment wouldn't have to come to Monterey. 
So we created, uh, uh, and so we ran another experiment where we used this portal where, uh, and it's, a, it's actually quite a nice system. Uh, this is still online. You can kind of see the link up there, aosnambari.org slash coop. Uh, this actually became the method for all of the in investigators to interact with, you, with each other. It was sort of my first real experience with, uh, uh, you know, sort of this, these uh, social networks being applied to a work environment. It was incredibly powerful. Uh, I had run prior ones. I actually didn't have that high of hopes for it. And uh, by the end of this field, we started out the field program with a telecon to make all of the decisions. So people would look at this for information, then we'd have a telecon. By the end of the experiment, people were saying, we don't need the telecon. We can do all of this online. Uh, uh, so some, some parting thoughts. I, I think this technology is really evolving in ways uh, 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 rapidly. So there's, there's changes going on everywhere, uh, batteries from the electric car industry. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on in cloud computing and uh, in ITR, which, which uh, are incredibly enabling to us. Robotics are, is clearly uh, improving in leaps and bounds uh, and has a long way to go. I mean, these are very simple systems. They're kind of complicated, really, right now. I'm sure they're going to become lower cost. I'm sure they're going to become uh, more capable. Uh, we have some terrific uh, problems to work on in the marine bi biology space. I think these are some of the great challenges of the age. And on the West Coast here, we, we, we work in the perfect environment to develop, test, and, uh, and exploit these new systems, attacking uh, really interesting, uh, interesting problems. And I think with that, I'll stop. And uh, if we have time for questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Do we have questions? See. On the back. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, I, I noticed, so, so you had the sensor suite. At some point, you had a hotel term that was on the order of like eight watts. Yep. How much does the communication cost? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and communication, actually, to us, is more of a delay than a cost. So we're working through a uh, very low bandwidth iridium link. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many baud it is, it's like 2,400 baud or something like that. Um, and so while you're sitting up on the surface, you actually typically are not powering any of your other sensors. You're using, uh, you're using some watts to communicate the data back at a comparatively large number of joules per, per byte. Uh, actually, I actually don't remember what those are. But the other thing is, is that your vehicle's inactive. It's sitting on the surface for you know, sometimes up to 10% of its operational time to communicate that information back. Uh, and that's with very sparse data sets back, back on shore. So, so I view communications as something which you really want to keep to a minimum. Uh, you know, for us, all the problems occur when it's on the surface. So that's where you get run over by a boat. Uh, that's where fishermen will save you by rescuing your vehicle. Uh, so uh, so we've, we've been saved a number of times, uh, once for real. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's communications is, is a real issue. And, and one of the things you know, that we think about with, with uh, these power systems at sea is what if those could be our high bandwidth link and then our vehicles could pop up and then establish a much higher bandwidth local link to that and then use those as relays. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for out of the box thinking of how you use these platforms more synergistically rather than just standalone to get much higher performance. Okay. And, and the, range, the range of the communication is on the order of those 1,000 kilometer or, or more? Oh, uh, the communication Iridium is a, a global satellite yeah. system, so you have okay. that anywhere in the world. Thanks. Yep. Are there other questions? Um, my impression is that the network of sensors that detect tsunamis is, is stationary. And I'm wondering what the pros and cons are of stationary versus mobile uh, for different um, purposes and whether it's possible to use both for multi-purpose uh, applications. Yeah, I think a, a great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think... You know, the majority of our long-term sensors, actually almost all of our long-term sensors out there are stationary. Uh, the tsunami systems actually are uh, very sensitive pressure detectors on the seafloor. And so, so they almost have to be stationary to work. Uh, and then you have a surface expression to provide a communication link back to shore. 
Uh, and that's what, that, that's what that surface expression is for. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of experimentation with, uh, if anyone here is familiar with an outfit called Liquid Robotics, uh, they're kind of local, they're sort of down in uh, San Jose area. I should have actually put a slide in. Uh, they have this really, really super cool system which extracts energy from waves and turns it into propulsion. And they're now beginning to replace uh, surface moorings. So surface moorings are expensive. Uh, you have to swap them. You, you, need, have a, you have to service them. And so if you can use a little mobile platform that you know, then gets swapped out with another mobile platform and it motors itself home, that's pretty attractive. Uh, we're beginning not to be able to afford the ship time. Uh, you know, the cost, uh, ocean sciences is under very serious financial pressures. And so, so finding ways to make this less expensive. For, for, the, for the biological systems, uh, I guess I, I'm arguing that you benefit enormously from, for one class of experiments, for these process experiments, by going mobile. Uh, or, or really, you, what you're really attempting to do is drift like an organism, right? <laughs> But you also want to understand what's going on around it. You need the context. So, so I think it's very much a case of there is no one size that fits all. Uh, you need a suite of these different capabilities, and you kind of choose the right you know, tools from your toolkit for, for the program. So. Uh, what, what are the biopower Oh, well, actually, one of my proudest moments uh, one of my, so the question the, was, the, was the what question was what was what are the biofouling issues of mobile assets? Yeah. So so uh, as 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 uh, well, of course, uh, we have enormous biofouling problems, uh, and uh, they very much depend on the environment you're in. If you're in the deep deep ocean, uh, if you're down you know a thousand meters or deeper, no biofouling, right? If you're up in surface waters particularly at these latitudes, significant biofouling, we can't leave things out for more than a year. Uh, if you're in uh, an estuary environment, uh, biofouling might be even much worse than that. It might be a month that you, you can put things out depending on, on how, you know, the nature of the instrumentation. So biofouling is, is a real problem. And I, I, with mobile assets, uh, that, 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 that 1,800 kilometer run we did, uh, the vehicle actually came back with barnacles, and so it was the first time one of my vehicles grew barnacles during a during a deployment, and I was I was very proud of it. And at the same time, a little dismayed. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.